I think it's a really big part of, you know, Afrofuturism. It's this idea of looking back and forward simultaneously, you know, and understanding the connections between history, the past and the present, um, and how these ancestral technologies kind of help us move forward, right? Hello, everyone. Welcome to First Fridays. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm Joel Kizan, Program Manager here at the Natural History Museum. Just a reminder, our theme for the talk tonight is Space, Time, and Beyond, Speculative Fiction in the World We Live In. We'll talk more about that, but first, a few things. Um, our theme for this season is Fandoms and Fantasy. We celebrate the intersection of pop culture fandom and the work and collection of NHM. Part of the work is bringing you folks here to NHM so we can not only share our stories, but be part of each other's stories and celebrate our rich and intersecting communities. So part, uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsors, Bank of America. I heard louder applause, previous <laughs> ones, but it's okay. No one likes Bank of America here, what? No, just, Bank of America and Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. There you go, that's, we're like it. One more round of applause for Bank of America because in case someone's here from, yeah, yeah there you go. Okay, a uh, special thank you to our media sponsor, KCRW. Yay. And our event partner, I Am Sound, for helping make this series a success. We'd also like to thank our community partner, Pro Bono ASL, for providing interpretation for this evening's um, discussion. And now, NHM, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce once again our host and moderator for First Fridays this season, neuroscientist and science communicator, Dr. Yawande Pierce. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, and welcome to First Fridays, everyone. It's great to see a full room. Our discussion this evening, I'm super excited about. So let's get into it. So sp Space, Time, and Beyond is our discussion theme, speculative fiction and the world we live in. So creating worlds and realities full of implausibilities and wonder is at the heart of fantasy building. But how can speculating on, impos on the impossible bring us closer to seeing what can be possible? So whether it's distant futures or unknown pasts, alternate realities or galaxies far, far away, how can speculative fiction help us better understand social injustice, philosophical quandaries and environmental threats? How has popular culture and mainstream media depicted the experience of people of color when telling these stories? And how important is it to have creators tell their own stories and cultural creators to amplify these voices? So this is our discussion theme tonight, pretty thick, and we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna cover it all. <laughs> um, so I'm super excited to introduce our guest for this discussion, John Jennings. John, <laughs> round of applause. Thank you. So, this is going to be impressive. John Jennings is a professor, author, graphic novelist, curator, Harvard Fellow, New York Times bestseller, 2018 Eisner winner, and 2021 winner of the Hugo Award for his work on the Parable of the Sour graphic novel adaptation with creative partner Damien Duffy. He is also the director of Abrams Comic Arts in print Megascope, which publishes graphic novels focused on the experiences of people of color. His research in interests include the visual culture of hip hop, Afrofuturism and politics, visual literacy, horror and the ethno-gothic and speculative design and its applications to visual rhetoric. Jennings is co-editor of the 2016 Eisner award-winning collection, The Black of the Ink, Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art, and co-founder, organizer of the Schomburg Center's Black Comic Book Festival in Harlem. He is co-founder and organizer of the MLK NorCal's Black Comics Art Festival in San Francisco, and also CAMCON at the California African American Museum Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, okay. <laughs> so 
So as we just heard, uh, you are an incredibly accomplished in several different genres and fields. So we're focusing a little bit on the speculative fiction space this evening. So, I mean, it really does beg the question, how did it all begin? Um, and so I did a little bit of digging on the internet um, and I heard that your mother actually greatly influenced your early interest in space, science fiction, comic books, horror, amongst other things. So I'd love to start by just hearing a little bit about how that's shaped okay. everything that's led to today. Definitely, definitely. Yes, you can blame my mother for all of those things, right? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my mom, Janie Mae, uh, who might be watching later. I don't even know. Anyway, so um, a little bit about myself. I was born in um, 1970 in Mississippi. Uh, came up in a, a very rural, agrarian kind of space, right? And so, you know, I, I started reading at an early age. My mom was an English uh, major at Alcorn State University, at HBCU in Lorman, Mississippi. And um, she had all kinds of uh, books later, particularly like Edgar Allan Poe, and she was always really into, uh, you know, Agatha Christie mm. and Stephen King and, you know, things of that nature. And um, she started me reading science fiction like really early, and um, I was always really interested in uh, mythology from various cultures. Um, yeah, it was it was really fascinating, and so. I was looking at stuff like you know Chinese mythology, African mythology, Norse mythology, Greek mythology, these types of tales and stories, and I was always really interested in um, you know folk tales and, mm -hmm. and actually even superstitions as well. You know, I, I was raised with my grandparents as well, and so my grandmother, uh, she was, she'd always have these sayings that I thought were like just made up or whatever. But later, with my research, I realized it was some things that were being brought through from the African diaspora that had kind of situated themselves in Mississippi, right? So, yeah, so that's where it started. And then, um, you know, my mom, she loved the fact that I started reading so early, so she basically started buying me comic books. And so, little did she know that she was creating an obsession. I mean. <laughs> that would become, you know. <laughs> so like, stuck. Yeah, so she was like, here's Spider-Man and Thor and Daredevil and Wonder Woman, you know, this kind of stuff. And so, I saw the connection between Norse mythology and like the Mighty Thor by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, mm -hmm. and uh, I was hooked. And so from then on, anything that looked like a comic book, I was trying to read. I'm talking like Hot Stuff, Archie, anything, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it wasn't just superheroes. It was like the medium itself was very attractive to me, you know. So yeah, that's and how it kind of starts a little bit. But I can. I could go on about Yeah, and then we're going to jump into some of these things, but also I feel like science was also pretty pivotal in your childhood. That's true. You know, I was really interested in um, bugs really easily, like entomology. I didn't, know what, I didn't know what entomology was at the time, but I was fascinated by like crickets and grasshoppers. I used to collect grasshoppers and fireflies and stuff like that. It was very, um, you know, Steinbeckian to a certain degree. I didn't, know I, was, I didn't know I was growing up in poverty. I didn't know that at the time. You know, <laughs> it, that was happening as well. But, you know, but it was also like, you know, this really kind of idyllic uh, childhood where I got a chance to actually play and climb trees. And, you know, I would literally climb on top. We, it was always a barn. Mm -hmm. I know this sounds like there's barns in Mississippi. I don't know if y'all. Anyway, I was like, <laughs> so climb on you know, top of a barn and, and I would lay, much to my mom's chagrin, you know, and, and look at the stars, you know, I was really interested in the constellations, and when I, when I discovered the constellations all had stories, I was like, oh my God, Game this is changer. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, so black holes and all that stuff. Rocks, you know, I was just really interested in science across the board, and of course, that leads to science fiction, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah. That's amazing. I love that it's your mother who gave you that early influence and then mm. helped you to get into comic books. And yes. The fact that your career has un unfolded in this way, as we'll hear as we continue with the discussion, yeah. is really inspiring. We actually have um, a visual because I think that oh, led yeah. to one of the topics we're going to cover is Afrofuturism. And you're yes. very much present within that space. And it's just your contribution to that space has been really, I think, significant. Okay. So. I mean, just as a definition, Afrofuturism is a term used to describe speculative fiction that explores the intersection of African diaspora culture with technology and futurism. You may have another definition, which I'd like I to hear another, that is better. Yes, Let's. I don't know if it's better. Yeah. <laughs> or different. Okay. Um, and so my question is really how you see Afrofuturism and speculative design as important tools for exploring some social and political justice issues. So I'd love to hear from you sort of what Afrofuturism is mm -hmm. and how that's come from your interest in science fiction. Oh, that's 
difficult question. That's a lot of, that's a lot of pieces. Okay, so the term Afrofuturism uh, comes from a uh, article by Mark Derry. Uh, it was written in like 1993 in this article called uh, Black to the Future. And it was in this collection of, uh, I know it's cool, right? It's I clever. Love pun. That's Black a good to one. the Future. <laughs> and, um, I mean, Derry is a, a, a cultural critic and a very, very brilliant uh, man. And at the time, he was um, looking at the, the use of technoculture, you know, as far as like, there's this thing called the, uh, the World Wide Web. Are y'all familiar with that? It was jumping off. So Are you familiar with it? It's, you type stuff into it. Never mind. Um, but yeah, it was, it was the beginning of cyberculture and how we were thinking about, you know, science fiction through these, like, you know, these newly formed connective technologies. And then he was looking at like the fact there weren't a lot of what he was looking at as like black science fiction writers. Right. Like the aforementioned Octavia Butler, we have people like Chip Delaney, you know, maybe Charles Saunders who wrote fantasy maybe. But there was very few, Stephen Barnes, you know, people who were actually writing sci-fi, right? And so he was looking at the fact that there's a certain amount of like, um, metaphorical discontent that's kind of projected onto the black body through the sci-fi lens. And so he, he came with this term Afrofuturism as a way to kind of work through those types of, um, those tensions about like being, um, surviving after a particular type of dystopia. Right. And we call it the, mass, the, the, the middle passage. But into, into a certain degree, I mean, we've, we've lived through a dystopia. You know, we lived through an apocalypse of a, of a kind. Mm -hmm. So the definition that I came up with is um, Afrofuturism is an Afrocentric critical making theory and process that uses speculative narratives to reimagine the past, interrogate the present, and design a future where people of the African diaspora thrive according to their own agency. And so um, I was thinking, you, you asked this, you asked yeah, this thing about- a, I like the expanded, <laughs> the expanded definition for sure. Right. Because I always get asked about it, right? So you asked about speculative design as well, right? So that's a term that comes from uh, the industrial design practices, right? Um, particularly from um, these British designers, uh, Dunn and Raby. And so they had this book called Speculative Everything, mm -hmm. which was looking at what they call diegetic prototypes or like design fiction stories. So this idea of like a designed, um, like a story space, where, in, where they created these objects in a design fiction that were not meant to be reproduced like in, on a mass market scale, but um, they were meant to be discursive in nature. So they were meant to have discussions right. inside of the story, right? Very fascinating, right? And so once I read about this and I started thinking about science fiction and fantasy, I started to realize that the fictive novum, the, the new idea, the science fiction thing that Afrofuturism is trying to, to talk about is race, blackness, whiteness, all these different things, the constructs, right? So we always talk about them being constructs, and I'm like, well, we need to look at the blueprints <laughs> and figure out how to, how to get out of these things, right? Because right. when you think about race as, a, as, a, um, as an object, it starts to real, you start to realize it's a type of technology, you know? Yeah. And so the, the, the question that I always ask is like, well, if that's true, then aren't people who are writing about race, aren't they really writing about a science fiction technology? Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where I'm getting at. And so the idea of agency is really important. One of my friends, Lisa Yazik, does a lot of research on science fiction. She's at Georgia Tech. And she says that Afrofuturism is the reclamation of the history of the future. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at, say, science fiction in the 1950s, for instance, um, there, there are no people of color, you know, <laughs> in the future. You know, I don't like, did we, get, did we go into another dimension? You know, did we fall through a wormhole? You know, why are we not there, you know? And of course, you know, if you look at like this, from a sociological standpoint, there's this thing called uh, symbolic annihilation. It's a term that comes from the 1970s where basically if you erase the experiences of someone, then you're symbolically uh, eradicating them, you know? And so what we've been trying to do with Afrofuturism in the classroom as a social justice space is to realign yeah. that perspective and to kind of like, I'll say, let's look at it through this lens and let's see what conversations we can have. And I think it's lovely that the, that the theme is like space and time and fantasy and these things because we tend to think about, sci about time as like this linear kind of uh, yeah. system of events, mm -hmm. right? But if you look at it from an Afrocentric standpoint, they're all happening at the same time, which is like quantum theory, right? So the past, the present, and the future 
are happening simultaneously. simultaneously. Yeah. So that would, yeah. Great. I'll <laughs> so if we could go to the next slide. Just, so this is some of your work, Afrofuturism. This is pretty early on, I guess. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, would you tell us a little bit about this and how that feeds in? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so I came to Afrofuturism as a pra as a as a practitioner. I want to say like 2008 mm -hmm. or so, and I was doing some work with uh, James Madison University as a diversity scholar, and I was I think I was rereading like Franz Fanon's like The Fact of Blackness at the time, and also. Um, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto, which is a really powerful piece. Uh, and I was thinking about like the replication of stereotypes. And so mm -hmm. I was, became fascinated by c cyborgs, which is a cybernetic organism. You've seen a Terminator, that's a cyborg, okay? Just wanna make sure it's like metal and flesh, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about the idea that the constructed aspects of, um, of the cyborg are the societal mm -hmm. norms, mm -hmm. because the, the term stereotype is, you know, it comes from the printing, it comes from the printing uh, profession. Um, it's a type of printing technique and stereos means hard or fixed. And so I think a lot of times we're projecting that stereotype onto people that traps them. And I think the fleshy part of the, of the cyborg is trying to uh, become subject, is trying to, to, to escape from that prison, you see? And so that's why I did these images. And then a friend of mine uh, who's Africanist, she said, um, that looks Afrofuturist. And I was like, you are making up words. <laughs> that is not a thing. <laughs> right, what does that even mean, right? And so that's where this early stuff starts. And I did like a bunch of those images and lo and behold, I started doing a lot of research and I realized that my work was fitting into a continuum mm. of speculation around race, around science fiction and fantasy and things of that nature. And around the same time, there was kind of a zeitgeist that was happening too. Like other people were actually kind of uh, thinking about the same thing. And so people like Yatasha Womack and Rinaldo Anderson, Tanana Reeve Du, N.K. Jemison, all of us were coming to the same conclusions, but in different parts of the country. And then we started working together. And so uh, little by little, you know, uh, my work started to become part of the aesthetic of this new way of looking at uh, black sci-fi, which was weird. <laughs> it's totally weird. <laughs> but yeah, but that's really what... Really, these images is visually so powerful. Oh, thank you. I appreciate sure. that. But we could go to the next um, image as well. So this is another project that extended from that. Okay. Yeah, so what started to happen is um, I started to work on a lot of book covers for the Academy, you mm -hmm. know, like this book, Wish to Live, or this piece, Home. Um, the other uh, cover is for Mindy and Keith Obadike's um, science fiction opera they did called uh, Four Electric Ghosts, which is like, taking the work of, um, oh, what's his name? Amos Tutola, a, uh, as a Nigerian writer, and he had this book called My Life in the Bush of Ghosts mm -hmm. and the Palm Wine Drinkard, which were very speculative, but very African, right? Very Nigerian. Which is very interesting. Yes. In, in <laughs> yeah. So imagine that aesthetic and Pac-Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And I was like, what? I must, what? <laughs> And it was an opera, and so I ended up doing like the, the book for that. So again, I was starting to reconnect, I was starting to connect with these people who mm -hmm. were thinking like this and you know, across the country. I actually put together um, a couple of what turned out to be Afrofuturist think tanks in like 2014, 2015 at Loyola Marymount University with Adelie Funama, they were called Astro Blackness. And I think a bunch of us were trying to figure out like what was this new iteration of Afrofuturism and black speculative thought and how could we use it to better ourselves, better the world, better our students, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because it's not a genre. It's, it's actually a, a, an epistemology, a way of thinking, right, looking yeah, at the like world. philosophy. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's what, so those, these covers kind of like represent the growth of that thought to a certain degree. I see that. And just knowing about your work and your background and sort of what we've just um, kind of explored with some of your work, the through line is very much storytelling. That's correct. And I love that weaved into this idea of Afrofuturism. There's also this interest in science, science, science fiction. This evening we're talking about space and time. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those themes come into this creativity and 
I, I feel like it's such a powerful tool to explore some of these concepts. Mm -hmm. um, and so thinking about some of the characters, so moving into your kind of comic book uh, or graphic um, novel work, um, the next slide I think shows one of your characters, The Mighty Struggle, which is a character who passes through time and space. Yes. And I think it's really interesting because, I mean, we've spoken about your early love of stargazing and lying on top of a roof and being like, constellations so cool and then getting into it and keeping it. But as an Afrofuturist and graphic comic book artist, I wonder how you see the intersection of art and science mm -hmm. in exploring and actually understanding the concepts of space and time and how you incorporate them into your work using the mighty struggle is, I think, a really good example An of example. that. An example. Yeah, I have to say, like, you know, throughout much of art history, I want to say that artists are some of the first people to experiment with new discoveries, mm -hmm. to play around with uh, your light and, you know, the camera and, you know, just kind of playing around with, well, what can I make with this thing? You know, right. saying, okay, it's a new technology, how is it going to help me make better art? Is it, is it useful to me in some way? It's all about, you know, how can I express myself through it, you know? Yeah. And I want to say that artists, that's why you see like a, a connection between inventors and artists constantly, like someone like a Da Vinci makes total sense to me, right? Yeah. Where he's actually like trying to figure out like, well, where's the intersections of these things? Because that's where all the interesting stuff is, right? It's problem solving. Problem solving, yeah. exactly, yes. And so the designer part of me, because my background, yes, I'm an artist, but I'm also a designer, which is exactly that. It's problem solving. It's not just making logos, y'all. It's not just like, <laughs> I need a logo. It's like, no, it's a problem, you know? And so to me, storytelling is problem solving. So in some ways, the first technology is the story, you know? When you, like, if you look at like, um, you know, back in the day when people were first realizing what the sun was, right? They didn't understand it was a star and that we were circling around it. They was like, okay, well, that is a god <laughs> and it's traveling and there's a, you know, the, the, there's a snake trying to eat it and there's a, a lion-headed god trying to stop it from happening every day. You know, that's, or like the seasons happen because, you know, this one young lady ate a, ate a, a piece of fruit, you know. Checks out. And that now, makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense, right? <laughs> because what we're doing is we're trying to, stories are a technology. And so it's not thinking about like just the cell phones that we have in our, in our hip pockets now or the technology that we're using to even have this, this conversation. But the, cell, the, 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 the technology is like a, um, an extrapolation of our humanity. It's how yeah. we make sense of the world. So that's how I think about storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, if I want to solve a problem, I make a story about it, kind of to think through it. Because I think speculative fiction in general gives us a certain amount of distance from the thing. So right. we can actually speak around it. We can look at it from different angles, you know, safely, right? And Octavia Butler was extraordinary at that, right? So about the struggle. So one of the things that uh, I was really interesting with, uh, interested in is to borrow from my friend Stanford Carpenter, who is a, uh, an anthropologist who studies comics, um, wow. the idea of constituencies, mm -hmm. you know? The superhero is, has become a national symbol, you know? Like, so for instance, you look at a character like Superman. Superman is the ultimate immigrant. It's created by two Jewish teenagers. He can't go back to the world that's been destroyed. His powers come from his new world. And he has this kind of like pseudo hebraic name. His real name is Kal-El, right? Mm -hmm. And he, he, he then adopts this new Americanized, you know, name, Clark Ken, Kent. Clark, Clark Kent. <laughs> Ken. Right? So the whole piece is about becoming, to assimilating into an, an, uh, an American, right? And so after the Second World War, um, the superhero becomes about truth, justice, and the American way. Mm -hmm. After the television show. So that's after the Second World War. Up until that point, you know, the superhero is a propaganda device, right? Now, it's, proper, it's a problematic construction, actually. Might mix right, and it's about, it's very violent, you know? Right. But we love them as well, obviously, you know? <laughs> so it's now they're dominating the multiplexes. But um, I think now we have this, uh, I don't know, this edict that everyone who is American has to have a superhero because it's an American construction, right? Right. So that being said, like, if you look at, like, the history of America, if you think about, like, black people in America, you know, and our place in this particular historical uh, space, what is the constituency of a black superhero? What does it do? And so I was thinking about the fact that a superhero that is truly of the diaspora would be communal. 
communal in it, not just one person, uh, right. not just me, several. not just me fighting against it, it would be a community, right? Mm -hmm. So I came up with this idea about a, a family in Mississippi, because I'm from Mississippi, right? Said in like 1920s, fire and brimstone uh, preacher who is very anti-racist, and this is like during the 1920s when there's a lot of racialized violence happening in, the, in our country, uh, particularly after the Red Summer, mm -hmm. 1919. And he's lynched, he's killed. And his wife happens to be a conjure woman and she captures his soul in the branch that he's hung on. And she cuts it off and she becomes the first struggle. She punishes the men that hurt her husband, killed her husband. And this particular branch is called the weight, right? Yeah. And only certain people can carry it. And then she talks to her family and they become invisible on purpose. And they decide to help black folk in America, you know, throughout generations. So then what happens is that they discover that the weight can time travel. It can actually travel to different dimensions. And what it does is that it seeks out the new struggle. So anybody can be the struggle. It calls to you. And so what happens is you have to carry the weight for a little bit. The other thing is that there are two psychics that travel with the, the weight throughout these dimensions. One is called Tome, and she is a collector of information. She's an archivist, so she records everything that happens for future generations. And then there's a character called uh, Spotter. He helps carry the trauma of what it means to be the struggle, right? right. And that's, so that's the character. And so it's not one superhero, it's the, the, the weight can be that the struggle can be anyone. Across time and space. Across time and space. In a non-linear way. Exactly. Just, oop, moving <laughs> <laughs> towards the different yes. struggle. Yeah, and so it's a communal superhero, and it doesn't matter as far as like age, race, gender. If you are ready to carry it, you can be the struggle for that moment. I love that intersection of time and space and the ideas and then bringing in these themes as well about social justice and those issues. Uh, I mean, thinking about speculative futures, we speculate about what's possible, but then mm. we also have science to help us to, as can be limiting to think within the confines of science, but also science is incredibly expansive. Yes. So I'm just wondering for you if there are any technological advancements in space exploration, which is changing our understanding of time and our place in the universe. I think the mighty struggle is such a great example of how you can play with the, these ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I mean, thinking about the recent developments that we've had, is there anything that really inspires you? Oh, that's a good question. I keep wanting to go to space at the moment. I want to try to get to space. <laughs> you know, it's funny because, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, our work with Octavia Butler's work. I mean, I've, are y'all familiar with Parable of the Soar? Okay, so, you know, it's about, a real, it's, it's about this young woman named um, Olamina, yeah. uh, Lauren Olamina, who creates a religion, and it's called Earthseed, right? And she realizes that we've totally decimated our planet. It's hopeless for, it's gonna be really bad on Earth, right? Yeah. And so she's trying to get to space. She's trying to actually, like, create um, a, a place where we can actually populate the galaxy and, and, and continue. And she feels like that's the only way to do it. So she's actually, like, combining um, you know, the, the survival of the human race with religion, but also with science as well. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, I'm trying to think about other, other uh, things currently that I'm, I'm really interested in. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I really want to speak about um, Octavia Butler, like as we heard, yes. um, you've, you did the, the design for the, the parable of the sour. Um, but I think one thing that I, I know you've spoken about before is that science fiction writers like Octavia Butler, they have used time travel as a way to explore issues related to race and identity. Yes. Uh, and you've spoken a lot about the inherent burden that many science fiction writers face of undoing the past in the process and the concept of Sankofa. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because okay. it is something that I think is always present when we kind of explore the work and I wonder if it's possible not to. No, I, that's the thing. It's impossible. I, I think, think it's, it's not, possible. yeah, I, yeah, I don't <laughs> think it's possible either. Um, so there's this, this term Sankofa I've been really fascinated by and it's, uh, it's an Akan word, a Ghanaian from Ghana. And, okay. And next one after, oh uh, yeah, there we go. Um, and so the term means go back and get it. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's, uh, it's one of the indinkra stamps that came from, that came over with certain slaves from Ghana. And the indinkra stamps, each one has a particular uh, meaning, like a, like, a, like a whole thought, right? And Sankofa is symbolized by e e either this heart-shaped image uh, or this bird that's reaching over his shoulder to bring an egg into the future. So the whole thing is about restoration of history. And um, I think it's a really big part of you know, Afrofuturism. It's this idea of looking back and forward simultaneously you know, and understanding the connections between history, the past and the present, um, and how these ancestral technologies kind of help us move forward, right? So that's something I'm always wrestling with, you know, with the stories that we're telling. That's why the, the weight and the mighty struggle and all these different things uh, are working for me in this, in this way. Now, as far as like trauma and time travel, right? Uh, some classic examples, of course, is Octavia Butler's Kindred, mm -hmm. right? Um, things like uh, Captain, um, Captain Blackman, and um, other stories like uh, Far Beyond the Stars, which is an episode of uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. They all deal with some type of traumatic space, um, black folk dealing with um, particular traumas that actually send them back into time to kind of deal with, yeah. un right. And so I started thinking about this trope, you know, it, it's, even in something like, um, what's the name of the story, uh, a Connecticut, Yankee in King Arthur's Court by, by Mark Twain. It's a time travel story, fantasy time travel story. And this gentleman from Connecticut gets hit by like an apple cart or something. <laughs> and for some reason, that makes, him, that makes him time travel, you know? <laughs> you know? So this idea of like trauma and time travel, right? Um, there's also like the Captain Blackman story. It's about a black Viet, uh, uh, army captain who's in Vietnam. He's injured and he's jumping from one body to the other through different black soldiers' bodies throughout time. Um, the Far Beyond the Stars story is about Benjamin Sisko and he's having a crisis of conscience. And so he's existentially traveling back to a, um, he thinks he's this writer in the 1950s, a science fiction writer, you know? And so it's this, it's this way of using time travel to kind of figure out tra traumatic spaces, right? So I came up with this term, and it's long, I'm sorry, it's very Latin, <laughs> um, but dinia chronosomatic travel is what I call it. So dinia means pain, uh, chrono of course means time, and somatic is like of the body. So the whole thing is about like looking at this trope in science fiction about like pain and trauma and how it causes you to actually like physically travel through time to, to solve that issue. And then you go back to where you came from, right? You have to, but you have to deal with this issue. And it got me to thinking that a lot of times um, when, when black folk are writing science fiction, there's an added burden of dealing with the past. Right. Yeah. So if, classic example, you ever seen this movie called um, See You Yesterday? On I Netflix? have not. Y'all seen that? It's a black time travel show. Okay, go watch that, first of all. <laughs> um, it's on Netflix. It's, if you have it, it's free. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a black sci-fi story, right? And it's about this young lady and her friend, her best friend, they discover time travel. They discover time travel in high school. She's oh, a wow. super genius, right? So she creates this mode of, tra of travel. They're trying to get into MIT or something like that. And her brother gets shot by a, you know, in a police incident. Now, she doesn't get a chance to go back and meet Madame Curie or like, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or something. She had now has the burden of going back to fix Before the death goes. Of her, of, her, of her brother, you know? So it's not escapist in nature, it's very utilitarian. So they're using it to have these conversations about police brutality and stuff. She doesn't get to like have flights of fancy and you know, hang out on Mars or you know, bump into Doctor Who or anything, right? She's, she has to deal with racism first, you know? And if you see the story, you know, it, it sets up the idea that a black body always has to die to actually fill that void. And it's almost like racism itself is a force of nature. It's a really interesting film, you know. It's a, it's, if you have a more positive attitude, it's very positive, <laughs> but it also is, you know, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about, like how, how like, you know, we always have to fix the thing first. We can't just, you have to fix it and then move forward, right? Forward. But yeah. There's also an optimism in that, I feel. So yeah. And it can be a tool, so once you've fixed it, then mm -hmm. it creates possibility in the future that, you can then move forward and... 
I, I, yeah, I think so too. The, the other thing too is that Afrofuturism, one of the aspects I think is it's always communal. It's yeah. always about like the race moving together or people moving together. It's not like, ooh, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. It's like Buck Rogers and his whole community in the 25th century, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it's more like that. To it, it's a very collective right? idea, exactly, yeah. Um, so, I mean, talking about speculative futures and staying on that, um, I mean, it really does Im involve imagining alternate realities and worlds, and I think the genre um, of storytelling, and it can really help us not only understand our current reality, like we've just described, but helps us env envision a better future, and this can expand into environmental justice and the environment and so many different things. Yes. Um, please, can we s advance to the next? couple slides. Yeah, here's a great example. Um, so I know this is a, a project that you've worked on, which is the concept of black imagination and how it relates to sort of space and time and speculative futures. So I wondered if we could like spend some time just talking about this idea. Oh yeah, yeah. So remember like we were, we were talking about um, speculative design. Right. So these, di what they call diegetic prototypes, these mm -hmm. storytelling objects. I became obsessed with that concept. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> And I, I get obsessed about stuff. Um, so I was talk, starting to look for like Afrocentric diegetic prototypes. Mm -hmm. you know? Like for instance, if you've ever read like uh, Parable of the Talents, Octavia Butler has this thing called the dream mask that actually becomes a storytelling device, right? So um, there's a science fiction story written in 1931 by George Shiler uh, called Black No More. And it's a satire around race in America. And it's about a chair that turns black people into white people, but not phenotypically. And they're like, white as a sheet. <laughs> and so it's a satire. Yes, yeah, a very, but this is written in 1931, right? And um, yeah, 1931. But also, um, while we were putting this show together, it's called um, uh, Unveiling Visions, Al The Alchemy of the Black Imagination. We were referencing Robin D.G. Kelly's book, uh, Freedom Dreams, you know, The Radical Black Imagination. So we're thinking about the fact that, for instance, at the beginning of every revolution, every site of change is someone imagining themselves in a better space. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I always say that one of the first Afrofuturists in our country was the first slave that said, you know what? The slave breed thing is not really my, it's not really my, it's not really my jam, you know? That's not my jam. I'm gonna actually run north. I'm gonna look at the star. These shackles are not for me, you know, and I'm gonna imagine myself in a better space. So I also think of like people who, who you know, during the Great Migration as Afrofuturists. They were mm -hmm. like, okay, this Jim Crow stuff is not cool. Um, we need to get up out of here. I'm tired of being in this space. We need to go somewhere. So Chicago is like Wakanda, you know what I'm saying? You yeah. know, so, <laughs> um, so, so I'm thinking about these ideas of black speculative spaces, and I started being really inspired by. Uh, John Acomfra's ideas. This is there's this film by this gentleman named John Acomfra. It's called the, the Last Angel of History. And it's a it's a really cool documentary about black techno music. And yeah, it's like it's about techno music. And science fiction is awesome. It came out in 97. And so he has the interlocutor for this particular film is this thing called a data thief. It's a time traveling archaeologist. Oh wow. Yeah. And he's putting together like pieces of black history, right? And it starts out, if you look at the trailer, I don't, are you guys any blues fans? Are you all familiar with like the, the Robert Johnson uh, mythology? So the Robert Johnson story, I'm from Mississippi, like I said, so I've, I've been to that crossroads um, where uh, Robert Johnson goes to this crossroads to speak to the devil, right? To become a, a better blues guitarist, mm -hmm. right? And in the story, he says that, that, that the blues is a black secret technology. And it just blew my mind because I never thought about music as a technology right. before. Yeah. So that was a really big inspiration. The other thing was the idea of the veil by W.E.B. Du Bois. He talks about black people living in a veil that is, um, there's a lot of black life that's unseen and mm -hmm. invisible. I was like, man, that sounds like a parallel universe, actually. <laughs> so yeah, yes, but the thing is, is that Du Bois wrote science fiction. He wrote this piece called The Comet in 1920. There was a post-apocalyptic sci-fi story. And then while we were putting this show together, we discovered that, um, well, two scholars came across a science fiction story called The Princess Steel. And it was written in 1909, 20 years before science fiction was coined as a term by Hugo Gernsback. 20 years. Wow. So we've been writing science fiction for a long time. Just not, we're just calling it black literature, right? 
So in that story, he has this device called the megascope that can see through time and space and other dimensions. And he uses it as a framing mechanism for a fantasy story that is his critique of the US steel industry, because why not? <laughs> and he didn't even publish that. He wow. did, it was just in his papers. Oh my goodness. I'm like, it's 1909. I can't get my head around that timeline. Or, or um, 19, uh, what was it, 1919? No, that's not right. I'm trying to remember when, when Of One Blood was written. I think 1912 or something like that. Um, Pauline Hopkins wrote this, this uh, story called uh, Of One Blood mm -hmm. that was about a man from a secret African society that's living in America. He didn't realize he's from this Ethiopian city and it's magical and highly technologically advanced and hidden. But that doesn't sound like anything I've heard before. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, so this is what this, this show was about. And so we, were, we did it at the Lewis Latimer Gallery. He's a black inventor. And we were just kind of working through the graphic representations of black speculative thought. Right. Yeah, and that's what that was about, you know. That's so interesting how it comes together and pulls on so many, thank you, like the timeline, 1909. It's, it's wild, because right? it sounds so futuristic, like speculative future. And it's, it's, it's like science fiction and, fan and fantasy too. Yeah. It's like The Hobbit and the time machine in the same story, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, and then also, um, there was one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, shoot, it left me. It'll come back. It might come back. It'll we come back. Actually, I, I mean, I could talk to you for hours, um, but I'm sure the audience have some questions as well. Uh, one questions? thing that we didn't get to is some of the, I mean, honestly, John has the number of different characters that you've created, each with these in-depth stories. So we've talked about three of them in this conversation, but also Silver Surfer is something that you're working on with Marvel. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be great to get some audience questions. Um, so let's... That went by fast. Is it that time it already? Very, it, it does happen. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have a question on... At the back. Uh, so I have a super niche question that circles all the way back to your work at Abrams, which is, have you found that there are new and emerging authors who are claiming the African futurism label coined by Nnedi Okorafor, or is it still primarily Afrofuturism? Um, I think right at this particular moment that Afro Afrofuturism is, the, is, is in the mainstream in a huge way, mm -hmm. mostly because of like really large films like Get Out and, and, and Black Panther, things of that nature. I mean, it is the, it is the, 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 the lens through which people are looking at you know, Afro speculative culture right now. And um, I think largely because it's just been building for so long, you know? And I think what happened is that, you know, Nettie started to examine what she was really doing and decided to, to basically put a stake in African futurism because that's um, where she saw her work situated, you know? So it's basically work that are that speculative is happening in the continent of Africa, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and that's why um, that kind of split happens or whatever. But to me, I think of the Afro future as a destination, you see? Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily, I mean, I'm really into geeky stuff like genre tropes and things of that nature because it's just fun to talk about it. But at the end of the day, you know, the Afro future as a, as a, as a, as a destination is still contentious in our country. I don't know, so if, it, if it, it's, still a, it's still like, a black future is still kind of pseudo oxymoronic. You know, right. if you look at what's happening in our country right now, you know, erasure of black culture, um, you know, the prison industrial complex, the movement for black lives, you know, we're utilizing speculative narratives and we've always done that. That's what I was getting at. During the Harlem Renaissance, during the black arts movement, we were always writing about better spaces and using science fiction and fantasy as a way to imagine that first. You know, so for instance, if you look at someone's work like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he writes about this diegetic prototype called the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a utopic space that we have not gotten to yet. You know, and you know, it's very Star Trek-y. You know, everybody's holding hands. <laughs> you know, everybody's like there and is happy. You know, everybody's got a full belly and you know, right? right. I challenge you to find it on any GPS right now. It doesn't exist yet. And so he was using an imaginary space to talk about the future. And I think that's what's really powerful right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, don't, I think that right now, Afrofuturism currently is the parlance to talk about it. 
And I think it's honestly just because it just rolls off the tongue better. Right. I mean, it's just very marked. It's like Afrofuturism. Oh, what is that? You know what I'm saying? But, um, but right now, you know, we are in a, in a space where Carnegie Hall just did an eight-week Afrofuturist festival in New York like last year. Or like at the, the Black Sonian, the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, the Black Sonian. Um, <laughs> there's a show that just opened on Afrofuturism right now. So, that's yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know if you can get more mainstream than the Smithsonian, you know, so, anyway. Did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I went off on a tangent. That was a lot, right? Anyway. A question just over here on the left. Oh, hi, yeah, I'm not sure if you touched on this because I walked in, you were talking about Cyborg. I'm wondering if you're referring to the DC character, like, Victor, but I was wondering if you knew or had a, an idea of his relation to Afrofuturism. Okay, so I, I caught like, so Victor Stone, you talking about Cyborg from DC Comics? Okay, he's with the thumbs up. Okay, I saw you. <laughs> and she so was asking, are there any other connections besides him to, to? I was late, so maybe that is who you were talking about. Just heard the word Cyborg as well, I was walking in, so maybe you already touched on it. I'm totally, I'm missing. Well, I, I'm, I'm missing the end of it. Can you say the question again? No, yeah, I'm just wondering, maybe you already touched on Victor, as yeah. a concept of Afrofuturism, but I was wondering if you've seen connections of his character. Oh, okay, yes, got you, okay, yes, yep. I think the, um, <laughs> yeah, the cyborg, yeah, the cyborg, I think, is a huge part of Afrofuturism. If you look at, like, the original um, article by Derry, he cites uh, Milestone Media as comics as oh. part of the, the discourse actually early on first you know because comics are still considered like low and for kids mm -hmm. that you don't really see it as being literary um but they've always been in the conversation you know um i think honestly and because Derry wasn't looking at comics at the time he was looking at like literature mostly there's a character from marvel called deathlock that Death was Rock? created in night well he was created in the 70s but a black version of him was created in 1990s and if you read his original definition of Afrofuturism and you look at that narrative, That's it. it's Afrofuturist. It's very Afrofuturist, yeah. So, yes, sir. Yep. We have a question in the front to your right. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk about uh, science fiction, the future, the mind, the power of the mind. And also, thank you to your mom for all the readings she gave you. So my question is related to your mom. Mm -hmm. On your second slide, I noticed that you have a third eye. Mm -hmm. Did she give you readings about Lopsam Rampa? Cyril Henry Hoskin was his real name, and he wrote about the third eye. What about? So about the third eye in the second image. Okay. Is it, tell me, did you mention actually about the mother of the matrix? No. Yeah. No, this is about a writer who, uh, he wrote about uh, science in the future, and he wrote about the power of a third eye. His pen name was Lobsang Rampa. Oh. oh, are you familiar with that work? No, I'm not. And I was wondering if your mom ever gave you readings about him. Oh, I have to check it out. It, it was, um, it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a common visual trope when it comes to like, opening up another mode of consciousness, you know? And so that's, that's why, why I use the third eye and some of the work, you know? Um, it's actually referenced in hip hop, it's referenced in like black speculative culture, you know? It's basically like another way of looking into it to pierce the veil, so to speak, yeah. So that's, that's why I used it, so. But I'm not familiar with that work at all, actually, so. Uh, hi, I'm a teacher from LAUSD and I have the privilege of teaching a science fiction literature course. Wow. Um, and actually, serendipitously, uh, we're about to engage in a unit on Afrofuturism. Uh, and we happen to be coming tonight. So thank you for this. Uh, and also, what would you think is the like one thing that if I try to drill into my students or, or open their eyes to the world of Afrofuturism, what, what do you think is the most important thing for me to teach them? About what's the most important thing, thing to teach about? About, about Afrofuturism Afro specifically. As a, as a that, movement that, in science fiction. I mean, to borrow from that really wonderful billboard, that there are black people in the future, you know? <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, not to be, no, it's, thank you, <laughs> but uh, 
that's a radical notion still. You know, that's, that's the thing where I'm getting at. It's still a contentious conversation. And um, that black folk have always been thinking about the future very differently. You know, as far, like I said, it, like, from like Pauline Hopkins to Sutton Griggs, Martin Delaney, W.B. Du Bois, Amiri Baraka, the list goes on and on, that the way that we've been thinking about technology is really about liberation, you know, mostly. It's not like fanciful. Um, you know, I make stories, they're fun to make, but I'm really trying to get across, you know, information yeah. for, for the future, you know. So yeah, I mean, I guess that's one of the things I would, I would get at maybe, you know, and that this is something that is not a new thing. It's an, it's an iteration of something that's very old and ancient, you know. Even, even the character uh, that Avery Brooks plays, he talks about that in his, there's this part when he breaks down, he talks about the idea of the story being an ancient, that's ancient knowledge. He actually says right. that, story he actually says that it's knowledge. ancient knowledge. Yeah, so anyway, I just got excited about that. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good episode. <laughs> so, I have to watch that. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, I think, oh, here we go. Um, I just wanted to specifically ask, um, as with anything culturally that becomes uh, accepted um, into the mainstream, do you have any specific concerns, say 20, 40 years down the line, that Afrofuturism will be assimilated to the point to where its origins are forgotten? And specifically, the people who put it together, the people who put their soul into it, end up being forgotten, and it becomes washed into society itself? Um, not really. And the reason by being is that um, you look at something like hip hop, right, where we're celebrating 50 years of hip hop culture now, mm -hmm. um, and people ignored it, you know, <laughs> for a little bit. I, I mean, you really, I mean, you really don't get the first really uh, serious academic book on hip hop until like the 90s. It's created in the 70s, right? It's crazy. Because, I know, because they thought of it, oh, it's a fad, they're spitting on their heads. You know, didn't realize how radical yeah. that youth culture was. And now you can't even sell a, a tube of toothpaste without, without hip hop. Right. You have like um, AARP commercials with, with Outkast on it. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. And, um, <laughs> and it's because it wanted to be sampled. And like, so there's, there's this idea uh, that Stephen Shaviro came up with this book called Connected. He said, hip hop is a cultural hacking it gets into everything, it samples, it remixes, it's like a virus, you know? Mm -hmm. So my whole thing is, yeah, if the idea of a black future gets commodified and sold to folk, to everybody, it becomes ubiquitous and naturalized like race has because that's what it is. It's a naturalized story, it's not a real thing. Um, but it's been naturalized through storytelling. Hip hop in its purest form still exists, you know? It's still out there doing its thing. I don't think, I think what's really interesting to me about Afrofuturism is that we were thinking about it for a while before it went, before it went mainstream. Right. The fringe became the middle, you know. I think what probably is going to happen is people get tired of stuff, right? We, we're only going to have so many Thor movies and we're going to have so many, just like we, you know, we, we get tired of things. So I'll we'll just wait for that to happen. We'll still be thinking about the future, you know. I don't, I'm not really worried about it because we caught this one. You know, we actually have been controlling the narrative for a while. And now my main concern is making sure that the future is vibrant and beautiful for my three-year-old, three-and-a-half-year-old right now. He is my Afro future, so I don't really worry about it that much, you know. Yeah, because culture is going to do what it's going to do. You know, I can't worry about that, you know. It's beyond me. I can do what I can to, to save it, you know, archive it and tell the stories. And pave the way and through that your teaching and your output. I think you're really having such an impact on the future of Afrofuturism. Don't make me cry. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it like right, I'll, I'll cry right in front of you, like right here. So. Stephanie, oh, they're at, right at the front. Okay, I just want to say you are amazing. You are so ahead of your time. Your thinking is amazing, and you are on a different level of consciousness. Okay, you're really trying to make me cry. <laughs> no, that, Stop that, it. That, that, <laughs> Thank that you. is just the truth. But what I'm saying is because you're so awake and aware, do you see 
Afrofuturism as humanitarian futurism? I definitely think that it, um, it's, a very, it's more communal and open-minded, you know. Um, yes, in some ways, I would say that. That um, someone, I was actually at a, a talk fairly recently and said that Afrofuturism has been waiting for the rest of the world to catch up to it, you know? And I thought that was a really interesting statement, you know? Um, I have to say that a lot of the narratives do think about the human race a lot, you know, as far as like what the future is gonna hold. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's about collectivism, definitely. Um, that's a really interesting comment. Yeah, I think it could be a more inclusive space, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, because a lot of times, you know, people who have been um, oppressed or uh, erased understand the systems better than the constructors of the system because we're always trying to figure out ways out of it, you know, and you understand it better, you know? So yeah, I think, I think that could be possible, you know? I think that's a great question to, uh, to end on. I think are we out of time for Q&A? John, this it, discussion it? has been incredible. We've talked about Afrofuturism in a way that I've never sort of spoken about before. Oh. So thank you so much for sharing your work and for everything that you um, brought to this discussion. It's been incredible. Thank you.